comment the clock says it's uh, 5 p.m. So I'm going to go ahead and open the meeting. Uh, Judy's not here yet, but she's in on this. So uh, she is. Sorry. Hayden? There she is. Okay. Um, you wanted to bring up the. Um, Um, what were you supposed to talk about, Judy? The the odor monitoring. Yeah, the letter to the uh, to the planning board um, the about the use of the odor control. So does anybody have any problem with that? I think it's a good use. Excuse me? I think it's a good use of the money. For, for the, for Mary, it's it's use of the, the community impact fee proposed to help hire a consultant for monitoring odor control. And I placed this letter in the OneDrive folder for tonight's meeting. So you'd find it there, Mary, if you're looking for it. Okay, I, I haven't been back up. I haven't seen it yet. Okay, in OneDrive. Okay, so I'll make a motion that we go ahead and send that to the, to the uh, select board. Seconded. Okay, any further discussion? Roll call vote, Sarah? Yes. Don, yes. Tom? Yes. Brant? Yes. Judy? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Judy, you want to just go ahead and send that? Or do you want me to sign it and send it? Well, I'll, I'll send you a complete version without the draft on it. Or okay. unless you, and you can sign it and send it. All right. I don't, oh, we should talk about, should we CC the select board? Wouldn't hurt, I don't think. Um, I thought we were sending this select board. No, I was sending it to Brian. Oh, right. Yeah, you're right. Yes, yeah. he's, he's he's a liaison to the committee. Yeah, I'll see. I'll see. Yeah, CC them. Okay. Oh, Brian and the select. Board. Um, Aaron is on here, and I think you've got some questions about. Uh, putting a solar farm beyond the cemetery on Long Plain Road? Yes, sir. I'm on with a colleague of mine, Eric. All right. Could I, could I have your last name, Aaron? Yes, sorry. My last name is Sims, S-I-M-M-S. -M Thank you. So what questions should you have for us? So Don has, you, you have talked to me several times. Um, I, wa I wanted Eric to, to join so that, that you could hear, hear our the, the view from a different perspective. Um, and, and Eric has been working with me uh, a lot on this project. And... Yeah, so you want me to just step in, Aaron? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I, I wanna give you guys just a sort of quick overview and tell you sort of the advice we've gotten and then sort of hear what you guys had to say or maybe how you could help us uh, pick a direction moving forward. Can you explain where the plot is? Or yep. Who's uh, plotted it? John Simorowski's pro project, uh, property. Across from the, uh, uh, the, uh, what's, the, what's the name of plot across the street? Just beyond the Polish cemetery. Just, just near the cemetery. Or near the propelled plastics, like near town offices? Yes, yeah. across the street. And it, it's north of the cemetery. It, it's sort of bounded by the cemetery, the uh, the train tracks, Long Plain Road, and then there's- okay. so uh, Way down, north north of Christian, got it. Yep. Um, What's the so zoning there? It's commercial industrial zoning. Um, and- Is this Long Plain Road? It's Long Plain Road, yes. Okay. Right near the town line, right near the town, the very south part of, um, or near Deerfield there on the corner. Uh, but it's on the, it's on the west side of Long Plain Road. 
Unless you come from the north. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so we've been sort of involved talking to John about this property for uh, a couple of years now, uh, working with the utility, trying to figure out what the capacity is. Uh, we expect the results of the system impact study probably in the next 60 days or so. Um, we got behind a, a large project that had a, a, a large study, so it just delayed everything. And in the interim, uh, you know, we were originally designing under the 50-foot setback rule, and so you know, last year the the zoning rules changed, um, which make the project probably non-viable from an economic perspective, uh, given what we expect the cost to be for interconnection. And it's a little bit of an oddly shaped parcel. Um, there's a wedge on the southwest corner. So when you end up with a 100 foot setback, you end up losing the entire wedge because by the time you have all the setbacks in this wedge, it, it's just not usable anymore. So we sought out local council just to get some advice on, you know, what do we do here? Do we seek a variance? Do we, what are our options to try to uh, live within a, a setback that's smaller than 100 feet? 100 feet? Um, and given that it's a commercial industrial zone, it's not really a pretty part of town or a lot of residences sort of thinking it would be a sensitive area. Um, we were wondering, it, our co local council said, you know, getting a variance would be very difficult and they just don't think our odds are great. You know, they said we'd be perfectly willing to help you try to do that, but we're not feeling great about it. And we said, okay, um, what about the zoning bylaw just changed to increase the setback. Did, did anybody think during that process or was there any talk about maybe a different rule for commercial industrial zones and what's the politics in the town or you know, would there be an appetite for that? And so we're kind of coming to you folks just saying, if we're trying to do a project and what we really need is a, a you know, probably a 50 foot setback on maybe the roadside and 20 or 30 feet on the other side, is there any way to get there? Do you have any advice for us? Well, I can make a couple of comments. One is that we reduced the rear setback for commercial properties in the original bylaw. The other is that our select board does not like us to do major zoning revisions except at annual town meeting. And that wouldn't be until spring at the best. Yeah. And that timing could work, you know, I mean, these things take a long time to, to gestate. So it's, that's not out of the question. I don't, I don't know for certain, but this is sort of what I want to hear from you. Like, how would we approach it? And I mean, the, the zoning setback in the commercial zones, if it's not a solar project are, you know, 50 feet on the front and 20 on the side, we could, that would be great. But the way I read the, the zoning reg, that's not the way it is for solar projects. Solar projects are other. Um, and they have to live with 100 feet all the way around. Um, and so if we, if we sought a change, that's probably what we would do. We'd probably just seek in the um, commercial industrial zones to treat solar as though it were a commercial or industrial use so it lived by the same setback rules. The other reason for increasing the setback was because of the battery storage, large scale battery storage and concerns about that. And I know that that's politically a very sensitive issue. What about that? It, can you just help me understand? Is it is it the size of it? Is it the look of it? Is it a, a fire danger or sort of what, where's that coming from? Do you know? Fire explosion, uh, concern about aquifer from leakage, yep. um, envir general environmental damage. Yeah, because there is a rule. And, and uh, I think a general fear of the fact that these aren't proven to be safe yet. Uh -huh. Yeah, and there are rules. You're, you, you do have those rules with respect to the aquifer. There's an increased distance. And if it's a, in a residential district, you have a five. This abuts. Go ahead. I'm sorry, did somebody ask a question that I missed? It's not. OK. Um, in this project, uh, I believe there would be battery storage and it would be on the south end of the project, which is- Does this, this property abuts the gas? Oh, is that Sarah speaking? Yeah. Um, it's across, the, uh, no, it does no. not. 
it's there's a the cemetery is is in between. Yeah. So one of the things that that Aaron asked a couple times is that um, could he get uh, a variance? And I, I explained that the um, Zoning Board of Imperial uh, Appeals very, very rarely gives um, uh, variances, but um, that they do waive certain requirements. And I would think that where that is, that you know, going to 50 feet setback and, and having a requirement that the, um, if, if there was battery storage, that it, it have, have a 100 foot setback. Uh, that that possibly could be waived, but we don't know and we can't, there's nothing that we can do at this point except uh, make a change to the, to the bylaws. But you know, it's, it's not something we can answer because we're not responsible. But we do have cases where in a reasonable situation, the, the Zoning Board of Appeals has waived uh, any number of, um, of requirements because they fit in the particular situation. So how they does that work? Town, town meeting votes very seriously, though. So how would that work? Would we, so the way I understand it, and I'm sure I don't understand it as well as you do, um, when we apply for the special permit, then the, the site plan review goes to you folks. And are you saying that in the site plan review, if we ask for something that was a, 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 a smaller setback, or you talk about, you call it kind of a waiver, that's something that you would approve, and then it would just go to the zoning board, and they would either say yay or nay, and it's just sort of up to them to. No, we may or may not approve it. Approve it depending upon what we find, what we hear in the in the public hearing, and then the zoning board of appeals will may or may not for the same reason. Mm -hmm. We Good. have no jurisdiction over 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 enforcing the bylaws themselves. Right, think but, we can but, waive we can waive certain ones where it's for the public good, but not ones that affect the special permit. I don't think the, right. the ZBA trumps us. Right, that I understand. But you are um, are you able to sort of approve it on your end for them to decide whether they like it or not, even if it doesn't meet the black and white zoning setbacks. You see what I'm saying? Or, or you just not even have that ability to recommend to the zoning board that they at least take a look at it. I can't remember any circumstance in the 12 years I've been on the planning board that we have ever done that. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it sounds like, you know, unless our council changes their mind and says, oh yeah, there's something unique about this where you're going to get a variance. Um, it sounds like trying through the town meeting to warn and seek a change in the bylaws probably that our best shot at doing it and doing it as narrowly as possible in the commercial industrial zone. Um, does that seem, seems like the, probably the best path. I mean, do you guys have a sense of, I don't know who was involved in changing it last time. Do you have a sense at all of the town and whether that's, uh, you know, anywhere near uh, a likely scenario or worth the effort or? I can't answer that. I, I know the town is, primarily concerned about preserving agricultural and forest land. Yeah. Okay. But they also have issues with other things. So okay. you never know. <laughs> well, we, we only have two commercial industrial uh, areas in the town and both of them are fairly close together. And I, I, I think I would be amenable to considering it Judy? You can always consider it. I, I just have no feel for the politics, which is his question. Well, is it, this is John Baronis, the landowner. Is it something that the planning board would consider 
putting on a warrant for uh, your next special town meeting? No, we would have to hold a, a, a public hearing before we could do something like that. Right, a public hearing, and then you know, I, you know, most towns have several special uh, town meetings over the course of time. No, um, we we would not do it at a special town meeting because we're under fairly strict instructions to take anything other than a trivial zoning change or one that's required for some particular time urgency to wait until annual town meeting because they were. Waitley doesn't have a quorum requirement for town meetings and they worry about a small attendance. And, and there have been people have felt that, that things have gotten sneaked through on, on the special town meetings, even though that never has been the intent, but you know, people uh, think what they want. And okay, well, it's now, uh, 516, so um, we're going to have to cut yep, this yep. discussion short. Um, if you want to hang around until the end of the meeting, we could reconvene it because you're not on the agenda. Sure. I really appreciate your time. That was super helpful. Uh, one quick thing. When is the next town meeting? I, I don't know that fact. Next spring? The or? annual town meeting is normally in April, but they've been in June in times of COVID. Okay. Got it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Get to your regular agenda. We really appreciate your time. Okay, I'm, I'm now showing as uh, 516. Thank so you we're going to open the uh, public hearing on what do we call it? DMCA? DMCP. DMCTC. So you're supposed to ask if they've paid their bills before uh, you can undertake to discuss anything. Uh, I believe we have. I know I paid a bill that came through uh, last week, I think. I, I would, I didn't have anything, any notification from Lynn about this when I looked earlier today. I don't know what the schedule is. Of well, Lynn is now Amy and Amy is new, so. <laughs> um, I know I had corresponded with Chris and he responded to me that he paid it the same day I sent him my email. So I think we can take Chris at his word. Appreciate that. Well, we will be double checking on you. Very good. All right, um, we're gonna give you the floor. Okay. Um, so I'm Chris Chamberlain, I'm a civil engineer with Berkshire Design Group here representing Debilitating Medical Condition Treatment Centers, Inc., which for the rest of the meeting we'll refer to as DMCTC. Um, I'm joined by Jared Glansberger with DMCTC, um, as well as uh, the company's attorney, Isaac Fleischer from Bacon Wilson. Um, the, uh, the applicant is proposing a marijuana retail location at 424 State Road Unit B. Uh, the, um, portion of that property currently owned by Yankee Candle um, and most recently occupied by Yankee Candle's real estate office and um, Bay State Health's medical offices. Um, do I have the power to share? I, looks like I do. Um, so this location, as I think you're all aware, is at the Sugarloaf Shops, uh, the corner of Route 5 and 116. Um, this uh, prop, these two parcels that I'm circling here are both part of a condo association at 424 State Road. Um, the uh, property that we're talking about today is this one, uh, which is encompasses unit B, uh, which is the Yankee Candle building. Uh, the other uh, piece of the property, uh, unit A, is owned by Old State Road LLC and is, uh, I believe it's leased to Toro Verde for, as I think, as we all know, um, another marijuana retailer. There's also a third unit in the condo of a small storage building, Unit C. Um, the property is in the commercial zone. Um, as we, uh, I'm gonna flip and stop this share and bring up the site plan.
here. Um, so again, uh, here we've identified uh, the building that will house the proposed marijuana establishment. And this is showing the neighbor land with an aerial photo, um, as well as the uh, properties that the zoning bylaw requires us to identify as part of our application. Um, stepping forward, um, this is the site location. Um, again, uh, this building here, this plan is rotated 90 degrees from the previous views. Um, and the site plan uh, is, in terms of exterior features of the site, um, is essentially uh, to remain unchanged. Uh, the major renovations will be in the interior um, for the store, um, but the existing sort of commercial layout of the site uh, works well for the proposed use. Um, and there are no proposed changes to the parking lot, existing lighting, um, or anything of that nature. Um, the total size uh, footprint, uh, footprint uh, square footage of unit B is about 8,000 square feet, um, 3,100 square feet, which is, uh, has recently been the Yankee Candle office building, will be converted into the marijuana retailer, and the remaining, uh, what is it, 4,900 square feet uh, will uh, initially be unoccupied. Uh, there's a hope to, sub, uh, to lease that area to um, a general office tenant. Uh, the property is being purchased by DMCTC for the purposes of uh, constructing this project, and they're currently under an agreement to do that with uh, Yankee Candle, the current landowner. Chris, which part of the building would be the retail facility? Um, <laughs> Oddly enough, that's a question that I didn't ask my client. Uh, so Jared, if you could chime in and just point to the portion of the building that we're talking about. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they can see my mouse, but uh, okay. it's, the, uh, it's the one on the Southern side where you have your mouse right now. Yep, there you go. Thank you. Um, so flipping back to the location plan, um, we note that there are, where do we go? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Flipped my wheel there. Um, we note that there are none of the listed prohibited uses within the 500 foot radius of the marijuana establishment. And as per the bylaw, that's uh, measured from the building to the property line of the other use. Um, the closest property um, that may be conflicting under the bylaw would be this one right here, which at least in recent years was a daycare. Um, but as we can see, it is beyond that 500 foot radius. Um, and even if it were within that radius, there would be the ability to wave that down. So, so overall, um, uh, we don't see uh, any issue with any of those conflicting uses. Um, I'm gonna highlight just a, a few pieces of the site plan that are critical. Um, and we're gonna start with, uh, as I mentioned, uh, lighting is not proposed to change. Um, certainly um, security is an important feature of any marijuana establishment and uh, retail, uh, perhaps most of all. Uh, the DMCTC is developing a multifaceted security plan. Um, as, as you've heard many times before with these sorts of projects, there'll be infrared cameras, remote monitoring, um, there will be staff on site when the facility is open and available to report to the site uh, if there's any incident. Uh, DMCTC has met with the police chief um, to review the details of the security plan. Um, of course, in these public forums, we try to keep the, the details limited uh, for confidentiality, for security reasons. Um, but uh, the initial plan has been reviewed with the chief uh, at that time. There were no comments on it, um, but certainly uh, the intention is to continue working with uh, the local police department um, to ensure that the final plan meets their satisfaction. Um, I'll also note that uh, there was a meeting with the fire chief um, about this site uh, at the same time as the last time I was here mentioning about Three River Road. Um, and again, the, the chief uh, didn't have uh, any specific comments, did want to ensure um, that there's a Knox box for fire access, um, but overall uh, did not at that time express any concerns with the site. No, that, that when you just mentioned Three River Road, you were saying the the meeting with the fire chief was to cover both of those. Covered both, okay. Which is probably not an important detail here uh, at this presentation, but it's how it's organized in my head. <laughs>
Um, uh, some other uh, key considerations, uh, you know, in terms of noise, uh, we see the this use similar to other retail and commercial uses uh, that might be expected in this district. Um, uh, the comings and goings of uh, of customers, uh, but as uh, as I think uh, we become more familiar with these locations as they've opened up, uh, the the security measures ensure that uh, that what's going on inside stays inside, and that that people are really um, arriving and leaving. Um, and so, in terms of some of the other uses nearby, uh, this I think we would expect this to be less noisy uh, than the typical use in this part of town. Um, odor control with all these projects is obviously very important. Um, the uh, mechanical system renovations will incorporate odor control, um, well, significantly less than cultivation or even manufacturing. Uh, there still is the potential um, for odor issues, and so it's important that those get built up ahead of time. Um, the uh, what's important to remember in terms of retail is that uh, you know a, a, a portion of the project, a uh, portion of the products come in um, made from the uh, cannabis oils, which generally don't have a significant amount of odor with them. Um, and then in addition to that, um, both those products and the, the flower products are typically sealed um, in airtight containers from the time they arrive until our airtight packaging and containers from the time they arrive until they're sold and leave. Um, the, uh, there is a proposal um, to use uh, an ionizing um, air purification system, uh, both for the, the comfort of employees and customers, and also to uh, ensure that that air is scrubbed before it exits the building. Uh, and uh, you know, DMCTC, um, has uh, operated uh, marijuana establishments before and, and uh, is uh, familiar with uh, the odor control uh, mechanisms and, uh, and tends to have those as integral parts of the mechanical system as those systems are engineered. Um, signage on the site, uh, as per the bylaw, would include uh, the allowed one wall sign and one freestanding sign. There's an existing freestanding sign uh, that's been associated with this building uh, that is located roughly here. Um, Excuse near... me, Chris. Yes. Don, um, my lights are blinking and I wondered if you wanted to set a, a continuation time in case we lose power. Uh, yeah. Um... Which happened once. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Not fun. Um, does anybody on the board have any problem with uh, doing this in a couple of days on Thursday or something to continue this, or do we want to do it for a week? I'm just looking for a straw poll at this point. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm out of from Thursday till the following Thursday. I can do this tomorrow night. I can do it tomorrow. I could do it tomorrow. Okay, well, that's I can do it. Okay. Yeah, that's, we've got a quorum, so we'll continue it if we need to. No, we can't. It's not time to post. All right. Thursday wouldn't be either. So a week from Friday, Judy? Yeah. You'll be back? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that would be the 6th. Friday the 6th at 5. I don't have my calendar up. August uh, week from, just make sure I'm doing this right. So this Friday is the 30th of July and a week from Friday is 6th of August. Okay. I can't do it on Friday. I could do it on Friday the 6th, I believe. Okay, well, we will have a quorum then. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so if we get cut off, uh, it will be continued to the 6 to 5 p.m. Okay, Chris, you're back on. I, got, I have one question, though, before you do that. Please. Um, I'm not seeing any handicaps parking on the um, site plan. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe that uh, it's... Uh, 
for you to see, I can't. But there are two spaces. I think on the aerial photo, I've seen that they're not currently marked on the pavement. Um, but uh, these two spaces uh, are at the uh, main entrance of the building with uh, hey, Chris, striping between them. Yes. I, I think that there is handicapped access um, right where unit C is. There's like a ramp that goes down from both sides from the red building and the gray building. And so there's an entrance there um, with those uh, with those handicapped uh, uh, spaces. Okay. So that hall hallway, the connecting, is a way to get into both uh, condominiums. Uh, yes, I believe so. Okay. All right. Continue. Go ahead. Sure. Okay. Um, so uh, again, uh, I think I left off on signage. Um, we're proposing the, the allowed one wall sign and one freestanding sign, um, which would uh, identify the retailer um, and uh, be compliant with uh, you know, the town bylaws and um, CCC requirements. Um, and uh, in terms of size and location, um, similar to the existing uh, signage that was on site um, before the previous offices moved out. Um, we have prepared um, a traffic evaluation, um, looking at the change in traffic versus the most recent use. Uh, the, uh, the analysis of traffic for marijuana establishments is in its infancy, to say the least. Um, the newest version of the ITE traffic study does include um, an entry for marijuana retailers. It only has four data points from Colorado and Oregon, and uh, there's not a very good correlation. Uh, the Actually, the largest facility that they studied had the smallest traffic generation, which you wouldn't normally expect. Um, so, and beyond that, the range that they gave for trip generation was between 80 and 800 per thousand square feet uh, based on the, the study that they have. So um, to me, uh, that suggests that that entry is not reliable data and shouldn't be used. Um, and so instead, uh, we looked at this a couple of different ways, um, looked for the most similar uh, ITE entry that has robust data um, and also looking at uh, market projections um, from the uh, from DMCTC, as well as looking at the experience of some of the other uh, retailers as they've opened up. Um, and so the traffic analysis is documented in the application. We are projecting um, an increase compared to the existing use. Um, and looking at the, the peak hour trips, which is really the, the critical um, period that we look at um, for traffic, is we're projecting um, something on the order of 20 uh, additional trips per hour um, compared to the previous use, or if, uh, to contextualize that, about one additional trip uh, every three minutes. Um, and so that essentially an average of a three minute gap between those new trips. Um, and uh, the, um, and so what that works out to on a daily basis is um, for both the office building and the marijuana facility put together is a total of about 360 trips per day. Um, and I wanna point out that when we talk about trips in traffic, that's one, uh, one arrival or one departure. So if you think about it in terms of number of people, it's, it's about half of that number. And particular to this site, uh, certainly aware that this is um, a busy area. Um, the circulation for this site uh, has two entrances in this location and over here. The property is split into two parcels, uh, one and two uh, on the tax maps, uh, but it's all a single condo association. And these parking lots are connected um, the parking spaces, of which there are about 87, a majority of them are um, on the Unit B parcel, but our understanding is that those are all um, shared under the condo association uh, among everyone that's there. Um, and 
sort of looking at uh, the uh, movements that will come into and out of this site, uh, there are really three directions that, that, that one may go, uh, north on five, south on five, um, or toward Amherst on 116. Um, and so certainly the, the movement north on five from this exit is a right turn. And anyone going south on five could exit via Old State Road with a right turn and then a left at the light. And then as, as was discussed the last time the site was under review at the planning board, uh, the left onto 116 is difficult at certain times of the day when traffic is heavy. And so um, it's easy to say all of that qualitatively, but also in the traffic analysis, we did try to um, look at the site as a whole um, under the future condition where there are two marijuana retailers and uh, potentially other general tenants at the site. And so using those same sort of generation numbers, we looked at what the peak period would provide um, in terms of generation. Um, and then, and so we uh, came up with um, a total in the peak hour of the site as a whole of uh, about 100 vehicle trips. Again, that's totaling entering and exiting vehicles. And so if we look at that in terms of the three motions that we're looking at um, and with half of those trips being entries, uh, what we're seeing is uh, uh, 16 or so left turns uh, onto 116 in the peak hour for the site as a whole, or to contextualize that, uh, that would mean uh, one turn every six minutes um, during, that, uh, during that time period. And so the idea that, um, that uh, there's a six minute gap on average um, between that, that really critical motion. Um, looking at parking, uh, as I mentioned, there are a total of about 87 parking spaces on the site. Um, <laughs> once again, the data are sparse as to any kind of studies of how much parking is generated by these facilities. Um, we do note qualitatively that uh, customers are at the facility for relatively short periods of time, 10, 15, perhaps 20 minutes on average. Um, so again, tried to look for different ways to uh, quantify what the different parking demands were gonna be. Um, so looking at the site total um, analysis that we just mentioned, uh, that breaks down to uh, 50 entries and 54 exits during the peak hour. Um, and so even if the dwell time for each of those trips was an entire hour during that peak hour, which I think is unlikely, um, that's still significantly less than the parking available. Um, separately from that, looked at ITG, ITE generation of parking for some other uses, uh, such as office, general retail, um, a pharmacy. Um, those are all pretty consistently around a generation of three spaces per thousand square feet of building, uh, which works out to about 48 required for the site as a whole. Um, and we'll note that, that actually the medical office use is higher than any of those uses by just a little bit that, that was there before. Um, but then if we you know, make, make an assumption that a marijuana retailer requires twice that level of parking um, and that consumes about half the square footage in these buildings, um, that still works out to about 72 spaces um, out of the 87 that are available. Um, and then in terms of parking and traffic, uh, some strategies that have been used um, in other places where the uncertainty of uh, these businesses moving in um, are things such as uh, posting a police detail during the open hours um, at the beginning of the opening uh, and then at the discretion of the police department, reducing that as necessary and also scheduling customers uh, in terms of giving them pickup windows in order to manage that demand so that it doesn't necessarily peak all at one time. Um, and those are uh, conditions, at least um, uh, in the initial period, as we see how the facility operates um, uh, that the MCTC would be uh, open to. Um, and then, uh, you know, those are the key items I wanted to highlight. I'm sure there are additional things that we wanna discuss, um, but the other thing that I did wanna highlight is that uh, just recently the town of uh, Waitley 
has put in a grant application seeking planning and economic development grant um, so that they can look at changes, trying to drive more businesses to move in to this commercial district. Um, and so uh, we just wanted to highlight that, uh, that this is a part of town um, that I think the, the town is seeking to, to bring more businesses into and DMCTC I know is hoping to be um, a part of that. So with that, I think uh, Jared and Isaac and I are happy to take additional questions. Excuse me, uh, board, I just got <laughs> back. Uh, is there anything in particular? <laughs> I know just Chris apparently just finished a list of things. Uh, should I just note that or things? He did an extensive review of traffic and parking Yes. <laughs> and much of that is in the site plan, right? Is, is it all there, Chris? Uh, I would say that, that all the facts and figures that I mentioned are definitely in the application. So you could just refer to the Thank application. You. Uh, one thing to consider, Chris, is that you've got a, a computer parking area across the street, too. Uh, um, yeah, th uh, certainly that's true. Um, and, you know, we, we hesitated to start looking at, at off-site um, to try to um, uh, deal with those issues, but, uh, but that's, that's a good point. Well, I think one of the things you may want to consider would be to get with the town or maybe the other corporation and uh, provide um, pedestrian crosswalk there. Yeah, and, and I know that the state has a project planned, um, and I'm not sure, uh, I don't remember the details of whether that's uh, being considered or not. Um, but it is state highway, so just uh, creating a crosswalk is, is no easy matter. Well, the first time somebody gets killed, it, it is, because I saw how quickly they changed the thing in Sunderland by the mm. cliffside. It took them about two weeks. That's just me being cynical. Fair enough. Chris, uh, what are the hours? What would be the hours of operation? Um, I think that the exact hours um, are not determined at this time. I know the bylaw restricts us to, I believe it's, um, I want to say 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, I mean, or no. Uh, eight, I think. Eight, that sounds right. Between seven a.m. and uh, 8 p.m. Uh, and uh, in any event, we're aware of the bylaw limits on hours. Um, and so the final decision on hours will uh, be within that time period. How many employees would be on site at once? Um, I believe the, num uh, the, total employment, uh, the total employment that I have is 12. Um, and Jared, can you comment on, on the maximum shift size? Yeah, that's right, uh, Chris, that's about 12, so we call that, yeah. Sorry, not total employment, the, the, the shift size is 12. So 12 of your parking spaces would go for employees. Um, correct, and um, the, the ITE numbers account for all parking spaces occupied um, at the time a business is open, so, um, in terms of, again, uh, to the extent that that data is are useful, um, it incorporates employees as well as customers. Uh, one problem with this site is that the bylaw requires more spaces per square foot than the site has um, for the whole complex. It requires I think if you add up the total square footage, it requires 186, 116 spaces, more than no 60s. Yeah, 66. 86 for the for the two buildings and your proposed rental area. No, 86 for the two. It requires 106 spaces and there are only 87. So um, the, the expected density 
is is really important. And I don't know whether that calls for a variance from the CBA or not. Um, it's certainly a an existing non-conforming fact. Right. But the Toro Verde application mentioned that they planned uh, educational conferences, which presumably would have a bigger, bigger um, number of people than just for the regular shopping and would stay longer. It also said they thought that 75 spaces would be available to them, but that's, that's uh, neither here nor there. Um, so you're not planning any any conference space or educational space? Um, the intention is for the remaining space to be leased for general office, um, not, not for any use like that. But the business itself is not being planned to give seminars, right? Uh, no. no. And I kind of think that Toro Verde may do a few, but I have a feeling that they're not going to be highly attended. I think that was a bone that they tossed to us. I do have a question about sort of odor control once the customers leave the premises. So they walk out to their car and it's sort of a general question I've wondered, like, can they just light up in the parking lot? You know, what, what's done to manage that issue? Do your responsibilities end when they walk out the door? Um, I, I can comment on what I understand of CCC regulations, but I better defer to, to Jared on, on an operational question like that. I think Isaac was going to answer there too. Um, so I think he has, he has the letter of the law. Yeah, I mean, I think my answer is going to be similar to to Chris's, but I all all of the retail establishments in Massachusetts are held to the same standard. Um, there's no uh, there's no what's called social consumption uh, allowed on site of the retail establishments. Mm -hmm. So it would it would be a it would be a violation of the of the regs and of the statute to allow customers to, to use the product uh, on, on site. So there's going to be, uh, there's by, by law, there's gonna be um, security on site, both in terms of uh, employees of the establishment and also cameras. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it would be strictly prohibited to, for any use of the uh, cannabis product on site. Okay, so it's prohibited, it's against the regulations, and by law, the MCTC would have some obligation to police that at your own expense versus leaving it to people in town to call the police. Yes, if it's if it's on if it's on site, then then yeah, it would it would certainly be covered by DMC's uh, security requirements. Right, but if they ran across the street over to the park and ride, then it's really out of your jurisdiction. Yes, uh, okay. and, and I think if that were an issue, DMC um, would would work with the city to figure out a solution. But I, um, I'd, I'd be hesitant to have uh, DMC police outside right. of its own property. <laughs> Understood. Any other questions by the board? So I think the um, Toro Verde traffic control will we'll probably use the same uh, wording as uh, for the condition as we did then. So I just had a power glitch and Don froze. Me too. <laughs> Our lights went out for a minute also. Yeah, same here. 
with a screech. Mr. Sloot, is there a question for Tora Verde? Oh, I don't know where Don was going with that. Don had a question for the board about what a condition could be um, to address uh, the traffic. He referenced the one that we put in the Toro Verde site plan acceptance, which was that I have it in front of me, every a requirement that every effort be made by Toro Verde to facilitate traffic flow in and out of the facility with detail officers to be assigned to the site as deemed necessary by the Waitley Police Department. I believe at the time the Waitley Police Department agreed with that. Yes, and I wanted to, am I okay to bring up a, a topic on the parking and traffic with the chief of police? Sure. Could I please have your name? William Beats, the CEO of Toro Verde. Thank you. I had met with the chief of police last week and as of last week, because I, I had some concerns over traffic and parking, as the board does, and he had said at that time that he hadn't heard from anyone from DMC as of yet from their security plan or their traffic concerns. He hasn't received anything yet. Uh, Chris, you had mentioned earlier that you had met with uh, the chief of police, and I'm just confused on that. Sure. Um I think Jared's back on. Um, that's one for you. The question was the chief of police? Yeah, I had met with the chief of police uh, last week or maybe about 10 days ago. Yeah. We had, I had some concerns over uh, traffic and parking and to see you know if he had the same concerns I did. And he said he hadn't received anything from DMC at that time. So I'm just, and Chris had mentioned that you had mentioned or someone had uh, met with the chief of police um, and I, he said he didn't. So I don't know where we're at with that. I'm just confused. So we, we met with uh, Chief Savini on our uh, cultivation property here and discussed um, the cultivation property, the Three River Road project um, that's coming up next and this 424 State Road. So that was all done at the same time. Um, and I can provide the, the date of that and talk to uh, Chief Savini as well. So then would the clarification be that there was a conversation with the chief, but that nothing at this point has been submitted to him on paper? Correct. So there's been no security plan given for the parking or for traffic for this location? We switched to digital submissions to the various boards, if that has any impact. So the word paper may not be relevant. Or, or digital. I, I think what, what Chris has said, it, there may have been kind of off record conversation, but no clear um, conversation with the chief about this location as far as uh, traffic and parking goes, uh, as far as a plan, a written plan in place. Sure. And so I, what I would say in terms of what's been submitted to the board, um, I, I believe that gets circulated to town departments. Um, but uh, I think in terms of a written statement of involving the police department in that traffic detail, um, it sound, I, I believe that that has not happened. Okay. If that answers the question. It does. That's why I was just confused because we, you know, the chief and I were trying to you know, figure out how this was going to work out and he couldn't really give his opinion until he received something from DMC. Is Don back with us, sir? It looks like he's not. And there is no one in the waiting room. The, um, I think it, it wasn't one reason it hadn't been mentioned is because this was a condition that the board, board applied to you folks, Toro Verde, in the course of our discussions, not one that you brought to us. So, so I would assume that. Yeah, I, I believe there were two conditions on that approval. One that the police department be satisfied with the security plan and then a separate one 
that a detail be provided um, at opening um, to be uh, yeah. And then I think the yeah and and um, typically I mean most of the boards have required a a written confirmation from the police department that they're satisfied with the security plan before uh, construction can proceed. We've seen that in a number of towns. Yeah, well, the, we definitely always require a written or a formal affirmation of of approval from both the fire chief and the police chief and would in this case. Yeah, I believe we, we Tora Verde didn't receive an approval until we had those things in place. Correct. So Judy, just to clarify for my benefit, looking at the, uh, the January 2019 approval letter for Tora Verde from the planning board, uh, there is language of receipt by the planning board of letters of approval of the site plan from Waitley safety officials. Are you proposing, Judy, that we reuse that exact language in the conditions of approval for DMCTC at 424 State Road? I would certainly submit that, but um, or something similar. That that's certainly the gist of what we would expect. Okay. And then in a similar vein, on the traffic, there was a require as you verbal as you laid out this requirement about facilitating traffic flow in and out of the facility. This was specified for Toro Verde. Are you recommending that as we start drafting up conditions for DMCTC that we use that same language? I started to think that, and then I thought that there probably in this case would have to be some requirement to coordinate with Toro Verde in developing this, I mean, uh, so or can we just assume that that would happen? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the practicality of this. Mm -hmm. You have two sites with the same condition and mm -hmm. it, should, there, should there be a need, I suspect it would be shared equally. And I'm not quite sure how this is implemented. So, so any thoughts anybody has would be helpful. I, I would speak up uh, for Tora Verde that we, our expectations was not to have another dispensary next door to us. So to put that back in our plan, um, we would have to really discuss that, but you know, we, we weren't anticipating another dispensary next door. Well, I, I understand, but you com you committed to to the condition, irregardless of who was next door. Right, we can we're committed to exactly the condition that we agreed on and that you yeah. approved. Absolutely. And I, I but, think that you no, know, it just kind of with parking spaces being increased, um, it definitely throws a an obstacle. And so I, I guess I would submit, you know, sort of for the benefit of both sides is that in terms of what needs to happen, that should be the discretion of the police department to, to be um, deciding on. Um, I think that if, if either retailer is beholden to an agreement from the other, that could that, that's, yeah. create a lot of problems. Well, I didn't think it would, I didn't mean to put it in quite those words, but it, I think that's and, a very good solution. And I, I think again, the, the 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 key is that um, that these folks are going to be funding the police detail, and so that that split, I imagine, is very important to both of them. Yes, that's what I was getting at. I think leaving it to the police department is an excellent idea. Sorry, the engineer was blunt there <laughs> more than you. So there still needs to be a condition. We, we cannot go back and change approval site plan review conditions on Toro Verde. That's in the past, but we can set conditions on site plan approval for DMCTC. And it seems like the same language can work here. Why can't it? It basically says that 
that in this case, DMCTC would have to work to facilitate traffic flow in and out of the facility with detail officers to be assigned to the site as deemed necessary by the Waitley Police Department. So it still involves the Waitley Police Department. Um, I don't know that we can, can or should force um, collaboration. <laughs> Ideally, Toro Verde and DMCTC uh, albeit competitors would collaborate around this, but being competitors, they may be less inclined to do that. But the Waitley Police Department as a neutral third party should be working with the two sides to see that the desired outcome is achieved. Yep. All right, so what I that when it, so what I think I'm hearing is that we have, of course, if we are sort of leaning, moving towards in the absence of our in the ongoing absence of our chairperson, like the queen of the queen of the anthill or queen of the beehive, um, we're moving towards. Are we going to? Are we prepared to make a motion? Uh, relative to approving this or continuing this hearing? What's the sense of the planning board? At this well, point? first we ask if there are any more questions from either okay. the board or the public. And I would also just say, uh, I can assume that, that Don will review the recording of everything that he's missed and that the recording is still active. Yes. Looks like I see Dick raising his hand. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm Dick Evans. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm not the chair, but we oh, do I'm, hear okay. you. Yes. <laughs> Acting chair. Thank you. Um, I'm a lawyer in Northampton. I represented Toro Verde three years ago when we were before you and the CBA. And uh, they've asked me to, to stop in to your meeting tonight. Um, the, uh, I just want to make a couple of small points, certainly with regard to collaborating with debilitating in the interest of protecting and promoting the public safety in Whateley, we were, were, we were certainly are willing and able and eager to do that. Um, I think we all share that concern. And with regard to that concern for traffic and public safety, I simply want to ask the board to take a look at that intersection across from the gas station on 116, where Old State Road intersects with uh, 116 which uh, Chris in his evaluation described as a challenging intersection, I think, and, and commented on shortly. I think three years ago, uh, somebody called it squirrely and that, that term has stuck with me. And it is a squirrely intersection. And so I'm simply asking that the board take that, that, that squirrely intersection into close consideration and, and consider any measures that may be available to you, certainly involving a consultation with the police chief about what can be done to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to keep that as safe an intersection as possible. Let me mention one other thing, and that is something that's kind of new to marijuana retail, and that's the question of delivery. Uh, I don't think there was anything in the application about whether there will be deliveries made from this site. So I'm suggesting that's something the board may want to take into consideration in uh, your deliberations. Uh, thank you very much. I think the board can ask follow-up questions of speakers at the public hearing, is that correct? Can I, can I just quickly respond to one of those issues? Um, as to delivery, um, I, would, I would ask that the board does not take into account delivery because it's not part of the, the application. Uh, I mean, I'm, just, I'm I'm assuming Dick is talking about uh, a home delivery operation, uh, which would be a, a separate license and a separate special permit, um, presumably, when and if Waitley passes ordinances to allow for home delivery. So since that's not a part of the application, uh, I, yeah, I, I would ask that that's not actually uh, accounted for um, in, until such time that it, it does, it is applied for. That was going to be my comment. Mm -hmm. It would, would require an addition, revision to the special permit. 
I was and, just, and I, in I, regard I, to the traffic, I think it's also important to realize these are both state highways and the town has very limited ability to do anything with them. I remember being out there um, talking about just this very question and the highway super said they can't so much as put a stop sign there if they want to because of the, the state right of way. Well, maybe we should find out if there's anyone else from the public that wishes to speak. Does the board have any more questions? It looks like John Bonavita would like to speak, but you're on mute. There we go. Thank you. The, um, my name is John Bonavita and I own the uh, property on the north side that, that is uh, under lease to Toro Verde. I, uh, I, I hear a lot of comments tonight about uh, their parking, our parking. This is a condominium association. The only thing owned here are the, are the buildings and the square footage inside the buildings. The rest of the area, the greenery, the parking, the turnaround behind the buildings, is owned in common between Yankee Candle and my group, who's owned the property about five more years than Yankee Candle has. We both bought it from the original developer. I heard talk this evening about uh, we have 87 total spaces. And Chris mentioned that in a peak time, his store may need 72 spaces. That's uh, pretty incredible when you think that we probably need 72 spaces also. Uh, we've heard talk I just, about, about 12 employees for their store. And that means we'll have 12 employees at our store. Um, and I, I think that uh, uh, this is all 424 State Road. It's not two separate pieces of property. And I think if we don't, if we don't address that, uh, uh, as, as Bill uh, mentioned earlier, um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that Toro Verde or we would have been interested if there was a pot store, cannabis store next door to ours. And um, to have uh, Toro Verde come down the road in the, you know, I, I realize that the monetary concerns aren't, uh, aren't really addressed by this board, but in reality, we have Toro Verde here uh, in um, to a point of almost $2 million investment getting ready to open in the fall. And, uh, and here we are. And uh, um, I, think the, I think the parking uh, has got to be addressed at some point. And so can I just clarify something that's very important um, based on what, what John just said? Uh, that number 72 is for both buildings being occupied by separate marijuana retailers and with a projection of double the parking demand than uh, what data was available to try to make that analysis. So that 72 is meant to represent my estimate of a sort of worst case accounting for occupancy by the marijuana retailers and um, additional office space. And again, it, it's entirely fair to, to quibble with whether those data are correct because there isn't a lot to, to go on, but I just do want to clarify exactly what I was um, representing there. If I may, I'm, not, I'm really not here to debate the information, but I've heard from 80 to 800 trips and uh, Chris say that the, you know, that the data is, is all over the lot. And I, I, I certainly understand that. But one thing I do realize for sure is that this is not going to be a neighborhood cannabis store. If you're gonna to come to this cannabis store, you're going to drive to it. And so, so I'm sure that the data that's been achieved is on the lower end of it, the 80, certainly. No one's, no one, less than 1% of the customers coming into this plaza are gonna walk there. So I think we have to deal with the higher traffic count, we have to deal with the higher parking requirements. Could just somebody please remind me the total number of parking spaces on this site? 87. 87, 87 is total. And John, 
Mr. Bonavita, you were saying that um, ne neither unit A nor unit B has some exclusive claim to a subset of those parking. They're just basically held in common and people can park in any space and go to either unit, is that correct? That's exactly correct, as is the handicap sparking uh, and, and the handicap ramp that you see under cover under the, under the, under the shakes that connect the two buildings together. So uh, the handicap access for both buildings is in the same location. One thing that I think might have bearing here is that if, if the remaining space in unit B is rented to a office use, peak hours would not coincide necessarily with the peak retail hours, especially on weekends and likely during the week. And one thing we could do is condition condition the site plan approval that the rental not be to another retail client. Mm -hmm. One thing I'd mention, I'd like to mention also, if I may, um, I forget who it was, uh, one, of the board, one of the board members had mentioned uh, earlier that if we were gonna be holding seminars, we wouldn't anticipate there be a high volume. Yeah, you're gonna call you back. Um, no I, would, I would I would go against that. That we're part of our positive impact plan is holding seminars and educational programs to have a high volume of people that come uh, through our store. So I just wanted to kind of revisit that from earlier. If I sure. remember your site plan application correctly, you had.
as a whole be doing, even though we're just applying to be on half of it, that it's important to understand the context of the site as a whole um, in, in order to make the decision. So I, I apologize if I've muddied that, uh, you know, the, the site as a whole versus what the DMCTC project will be generating, but um, I did think that that was important. Well, I would like to propose that we discuss a condition that the MCTC not rent the remaining space to another retailer. Because I think that exacerbates the peak period process problem. And I don't think it conflicts with their proposal. Can I just clarify, is, um, is that any kind of retailer? Or, or marijuana retailer? Any kind of retailer. I'm, I'm trying to avoid evening and weekend peak usage. And I think one of the problems that we've got here is that we've all looked at the problem in Northampton, but doing a visual casual drive-by of other marijuana establishments, it's a real anomaly. And the problem is that we've got people coming up from Connecticut, which is gonna start slowing down, but not in a year, till a year, but um, nobody else has got even 10% of what's going on in Northampton. The, the, the Rise place over in, in Amherst, I've never seen more than 10 or 12 cars in there. Uh, the place in Greenfield, a dozen maybe once in a while, but um, I'm just not seeing the numbers anyplace else. Well, we don't have the students back at full strength yet, which will make a difference. Same situation. Uh, well, there weren't quite as many students, but. Um, you know, I, I would say to that, that most of the students are under 21, so they shouldn't be parking <laughs> these dispensaries. You forget the size of the graduate department. So. Oh, that's fair. Okay. Yeah, you got me on that one then. But there's okay. another, there's a couple of others that um, are, I think, over on Route 9 now. So, yeah. So you don't think that condition is necessary, Don? I, I think we'd be stepping beyond our bounds um, to require mm -hmm. them not to. Well, no, parking, parking yeah. is parking and traffic are definitely our bounds. Right, but based the on BBA a, normally delegates. Uh, I don't know about the the hmm. difference between what's required under the bylaw and what what's there, yeah. but but the actual estimate of traffic flow is something that the ZBA and routinely delegates to us. I, I guess I would also add that those uses you're talking about, uh, retail uh, in particular, is already a special permit required, um, even in the commercial zone. Okay. I, I think if we wanted to, felt we needed to put that condition on, it would have to tie into actual parking usage. And that would have to be historical. And I don't think you're probably looking at adding somebody in in the, in the near future or what, what's the plan for that? As soon as possible. Um, Jared, I think that's for you. And the question is how soon would we be looking to bring in co-tenants in our, in yes. our uh, side of it? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, we would be looking out to see who would make a complimentary uh, tenant with us uh, in the building. Um, so there's, you know, there's no set uh, deadline, but um, we would, you know, uh, soon after we take ownership, begin to uh, put viewers out to see what tenants would make sense for us as, as co-tenants. What I think I'm hearing in the spirit of Judy's remarks, which I generally support, is that we would, we would desire that when DMCTC takes on a tenant, there is a, there's an additional traffic analysis and they take on that tenant cognizant of not dramatically exacerbating 
existing parking challenges. So I might be less supportive of a condition that says, you know, not another retail, but a condition along the lines of something associated with impact on parking. And so I guess, Brent, I would suggest that your zoning bylaw already does that because in the commercial zone, a professional and business office is allowed by right with no review, but a retail establishment um, would be required to get a special permit. And that would require site plan review, which would also require that traffic analysis. Okay. So if the MCTC rents to an office tenant, it's much, it's going to be a much easier process to get them in. And so that becomes more desirable for them in the first place. That works for me. One thing I'd like to add is that Toro Verde also has 4,000 additional square feet that is not part of the dispensary that we are talking to a couple of other renters to come in there, which will create more traffic. Um, one is a restaurant. And one is actually the Chamber of Commerce, uh, which will have in and out of traffic, you know, throughout the day. So I just want to make sure that's in, you know, in your decision as well, as more, you know, spaces are needed. It didn't help your situation very much for me. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me, I didn't get that. Is that for me? I, I, would, I would just like to, I don't know if we're still uh, discussing a, uh, a condition on, um, on what kind of use that uh, the remaining space uh, can, is allowable. Um, but, you know, of course, if it were retail, it would be another special permit process where the planning board would have an opportunity to review the traffic situation anew, hopefully with actual data from actual use at that point. Um, but also I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure that the special permit for uh, the marijuana retail can include a limitation on use of the rest of the, um, the rest of the building. I think that would go beyond a traffic regulation and that, that would really be a, a direct limitation on, on use uh, that, that goes beyond what's in the zoning bylaws. Do restaurants require a special permit as well? Um, they do, yes. I, I happen to have it open right now. I didn't just know that. <laughs> I thought they did, but I don't have it open either. Yes, yeah, so, so a re restaurant would be allowed at this location by special permit. Well, I'll withdraw the suggestion for the condition. Okay. Anything else from the board? Okay. Maybe I'm gonna ask this question. This is not a question to, to the applicant. I'm hearing um, that in some sense, and maybe I'm listening between the lines here, that um, Torre Verde, Torre Verde would, would encourage the planning board to deny this site plan on the basis of concerns about parking because there's something about this particular uh, use that would create unusual parking challenges compared to others. And I guess my question to the planning board is, um, how do we do we do we how do we address that? And I actually don't know the answer. Do we do we go ahead and vote to approve? Do we do a do a straw poll? Right now, I mean, I'll we have no authority. We have no ability to deny. Mm -hmm. We can condition but we can't deny. So and, even if we did it, say that the, there was the parking, we could, we could not approve because of concerns about parking. I think our, our recourse would be to probably to write to the ZBA and say that we felt it was a concern 
and that they should take that into account in approved in granting the special permit. If, if we felt strongly enough that that was an issue. Okay, and that was purely information. Don't interpret this as my making that recommendation. The, the thing that has me the most concerned is um, that we won't have any real information in, on the density of parking until it's been, both places have been open for a couple of weeks at least, or, or perhaps a month. I mean, I watched the, the cops sit there at, uh, uh, on roof, route uh, 116 and just waste his whole day for a whole month in Amherst. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, are you more concerned that this is gonna be a non-problem or that's what I'm hearing? What, what does that imply for the, what, the way we treat this dog? So I got a lot of, what was the question, Judy? Your comment is a valid one, but I'm not sure how it affects our going forward. We need to well, continue. We, we don't know what's going to happen. That's and and to assume the very worst um, is in some ways a good idea, but because we've got two marijuana establishments in here, um, I I'm just kind of floundering here. Yeah, we need to continue this hearing. We're about six minutes away from the floodplain review, and we have another special hearing. That's right. Another. Yeah. I don't think we're, I, I don't sense that we're necessarily opposed to this application. Am I wrong? I am not opposed to it. And I'm taking somewhat, I'm taking on face value what Chris has presented in terms of their parking analysis, which would give me reason to believe unless strongly disputed by another party that there's gonna be sufficient parking to make this work. If, if that's, if, if there are no other extra comments, I suggest we close the public hearing and continue our discussion among our, and I think we're pretty close to a resolution. So I would not suggest continuing, but it's, it's a you do valid that, point, Tom. Yeah, before you do that, just a procedural question. If you were to vote tonight, can Don vote because he missed a portion of the hearing? I just wanna make sure that we do everything properly. Could you hear it all, Don? No, I completely lost it for a while. Okay, so I think you can't vote. But we have a quorum for the four that. Can I bring up a, uh, I bring a point up? Or can we, uh, on your condition, we talked about earlier as far as sitting down with the police chief and going over what he believes that would be a good resolution. Are we still going down that path uh, as a condition or no? We, are, we aren't. We haven't discussed formally what the conditions are, but I didn't sense that we were moving and requiring anybody to sit down with anybody. Let me just, I'll just say to Judy and to, I'm sorry, I just made your, uh, Billy. Um, and I'm sorry, Billy, I'm just going off of your name in Zoom. I would normally use your last name if I could see it. So apologies, no disrespect is meant. Um, so to Judy, I would say I was thinking that we were, as far as conditions on DMCTC, we were leaning towards, um, of course, receipt by the planning board of letters of approval of the site plan from Waitley safety officials. And however that gets done, whether that's sitting down or however, is that's not our, ours, our concern. No, but yeah. he's representing Toro Verde. Yeah. So and, our agreement so with our, our, was originally that they work with the police and 
bring in traffic control as needed. And I don't mm -hmm. think it was required. It was just common sense. I don't remember. Well, that. it's required that they bring it in as needed. It, 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 right. was, it was required. But it wasn't required that they be there every day for eight hours. No, it's, but it's. And I remember we discussed for a long time uh, at that meeting, the text, and I believe it was settled on at the discretion of the police department um, so that they would be the yeah. arbiter. As, as deemed necessary, yeah. yeah. So, and I so think we talked about approving. I just didn't want to say we were going to approve that precise language, Brent, until, until we did. Sure. That would be the initial draft. I, I, I don't. Have we, the planning board, have we, the planning board, concluded there are enough parking spaces to satisfy the needs of both operations? Plus, potentially a third operation coming in from Toro Verde? There will be a third. There will be a third. Yeah, we, have, we made uh, 4,000 extra square feet to have a, a tenant next to us. So are, have, has the planning board saying we've, we've concluded there's enough parking spaces there? And then, then my question is, what is the responsibility slash the liability of the planning board in potentially contributing to a situation where we exceed the capacity? Uh, Tom, I think to answer that, if they try to put in a retail um, establishment, they will have to get a special permit. And the special permit issuers can can deny if they don't feel that there's sufficient parking. And uh, if they put in office space, then it may be a problem, but problem it could be a problem, but it, it definitely would it wouldn't be definitely a problem. So why doesn't that apply to the two operations that are going on right now? The exact same principle that you just stated, Don. Why doesn't that apply to these two um, existing things where it sounds like we're not certain there's enough park? Well, I think, I think the numbers that Chris presented would show that there's enough parking unless it's another retail client. So yeah, and all I analyzed was the, the sort of office by right use in that location. Um, so again, I, we could go through and, and analyze the worst possible special permit use in both locations, and then it would probably exceed what's available. But um, in terms of these two establishments, one that's been permitted, one that is seeking a permit, and then the remaining space being filled in by a by right use uh, in a what I believe is a pretty conservative analysis showed that, that we were um, below the capacity of the site. What I'll say. What was the 106 spaces that were talked about earlier in the meeting? Technically for the way the zoning bylaw is written, there should be 150, one, one space for every 150 square feet. And that was a calculation of your 5,000 square feet. I'm, I'm sorry, your, your Toro Verde is 5,000, I think, right? Plus. A total of 8,000, but there's, we separated uh, 5,000 and it's 4,500, 3,500 now. Okay, well, that counted your 5,000 plus the 3,000 for DMCTC's retail facility, plus another 3,000 for, for um, the remaining space. The remaining, no, another, another 33 for the remaining space. Um, so, so your your additional so that adds up to what eighty six, but then your additional four thousand would bring it up to over a hundred. So in the current 
state of the parking lot today with everything we're talking about, we would be, oh, we're under on spaces. Or so the, old, the, old, the old site, park. yeah, the, the site was constructed originally with fewer parking spaces than the zoning bylaw requires, which I, I imagine the planning board was, uh, had permission to waive at the time. I, I don't know the history of it. It might have preceded the zoning. I don't know. Oh, that could be. So the site, the site does not have enough parking spaces for all of the all of the area to be and per compliant the with with the with the current zoning. Well, whether that's an issue or not is probably the ZBA's. That would be the ZBA's authority, I would think. But I don't think that the two the two retail facilities would not exceed, and two retail facilities plus the the other approved proposed DMCTC facility would not exceed. But if you get to a if if you get to another facility it would exceed. So maybe this is something that the maybe this is something we should point out to the to the ZBA. And maybe we should continue till after they they discuss in, it. In, in effect, are, are by making that decision, are we telling Toro Verde that don't come back to us for for site plan review for a retail operation. So de, de facto we're making that decision now also. I would think adding another retail operation of the size of the either of the available remaining spaces would be very difficult. And if if I could just put a point out, when we develop our location, we we don't have that condition that was already approved. So I'd hate for a condition to come against us because another dispensary is coming next to us. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure like, what condition you know, if, you're referring to. If we weren't allowed to have a retail or another um, establishment next to us because there, you know, is another. That's That's been withdrawn, Billy. Okay, I, I thought Tom just brought that up. No, because what would happen would be if you wanted to bring a retail space in there, it would have to go through the ZBA and they would make the decision. And they would probably deny it because if it turns out at that point that their, their parking lot is already full, um, they would, well, I can't say what they would say, but they would be the ones that would make that, that decision. We can't make that, um, that decision at all. But it's already exceeded, like I, I it, Correct me if I'm wrong. It's already exceeded at this point now, with where we're at. No. Yeah, so no, I I think that what's important to stay focused on is that uh, there's there's already um, a marijuana retail establishment permitted there, as Torre Verde, and now um, DMC is coming along and applying uh, for a permit for a second marijuana retail establishment. And there, there is sufficient parking, both by the zoning bylaw and by um, the traffic report for to permit both of those uses. Uh, I, I think it's helpful to take into consideration that there is more available space um, on, the, on the parcels and there could potentially be other uses in the future. But I, I don't think that when, for instance, Torre Verde came for their permit, um, they did a traffic report uh, based on every possible potential future use of both parcels. Uh, they were reviewed for their use. And uh, I think that it makes sense for DMC to be reviewed for their use plus the existing permitting use, which is Torre Verde. Uh, but, but there's plenty of parking for those uses. But there is not enough parking for any more uh, retail establishments. Only for office space. I, I, I think well, that's, that, yeah, and, and I'll say I haven't actually analyzed that. I, I couldn't I tell think, you right I now. Think, um, 
that would depend on the type of retail and the yeah. traffic analysis done at that point and and the special permit application. Right. I misspoke a bit. Yeah. So right. a retailer that sold fruit cakes that only had one customer <laughs> per week would not and be a problem. If it's helpful, um, there is a method of analyzing parking. We, oh, sorry, Billy. Oh no. oh, no, I was just saying, you know, in comparison to the fruit cake, fruit cake stand, I was saying if a restaurant goes in there, um, obviously there'd be a high volume of traffic. And that probably wouldn't fly. Which and, I and, you know, and, and you know, when we went for our um, permit in, in our location here, you know, we had big plans and, you know, we have uh, close to $2 million invested mm -hmm. into this location. Um, and now we're to the point where we knew we were going to have other neighbors, but we didn't know that it would limit us to who we would have as our tenant. And now we're seeing that it's a possibility that this could limit us because there's, you know, another high volume retail space can be occupied. Yeah. Well, that's so definitely I guess, a possibility. Yeah, and I, I would, that way. I would throw two things. Um, the first one is that, that there is a method of parking analysis to look at dissimilar uses that have different traffic patterns uh, called shared parking. And so it, it's, it's not as simple as the peak of A plus the peak of B is the peak um, that, that you got to look at the, the time characteristics of those. So, so it's a little more complicated, which could be done. But um, regardless, you know, sort of the flip side of it is that um, if the restaurant use had come first, it may have precluded anything else from going into building B that's not by right. Um, and, and that would have been um, fair also uh, against uh, Jared's project. He may not have been able to bring in um, this retailer if there were two special permit uses with high parking demand in building A. I think we have to, that's a good way of saying, I think we have to stick to the existing application and its implications. And I suggest since it's already quarter seven and we why don't you move have an appointment Judy. at- Judy, why don't you move it? Well, instead of suggesting, why don't you make a motion? Okay, well, I'm not, we need to close the public hearing. Is that a motion? I move, okay, I move we close the public hearing. Second. I'll second. <laughs> okay. Roll call vote, Sarah? Yes, close. On yes, Tom? Yes. Grant? Yes. Judy? Yes. Okay, the meeting is, con uh, we're going to Hearing. close it, right? Yeah. We're not going to close. Okay. Thank you for all your input. Well, now what? Do we discuss? Do we vote or do we continue? Um, I think we need some guidance on this or at least discussion with uh, ZBA hmm. and um, possibly council. I. Right. This gives a sense we're, we're back. We're backing into a situation here um, without knowing the, the full impact of of that decision. Okay. Well, if we're bringing in other opinions, I think we shouldn't have closed the public hearing. So, um, if we're bringing in additional information, I don't disagree with your point, but so maybe we need to undo that vote and continue the hearing. I, I don't think so, because if we try to get the ZBA to come in and, and say, yes, they would do this or no, they won't do that, we're not going to get any answer from them. They, they will not presume that anything about any kind of decision they would make. I mean, I've I talked to Ro Roger a lot about that, and he won't, he won't wink at you. So is there any other? Well, I heard Tom say town council. I heard Tom say town council. Yeah. I'll just say I'm prepared to move to a vote and establish the conditions. I don't feel a need to continue this or seek other input. Tom, do you feel that 
strongly that we should bring in town council? Yeah, I, I, I just worry we're back. I, we're, we're, we're making one decision and denying an application that hasn't even come before us yet in terms of what, what that application could be. We're and not I, not. I, you know, my, well, if, if you if there, if the if it exceed, if the application exceeds the parking capacity, you de facto denied their application on this date for some action that will occur in the future. And I just don't have enough information. How to I, I personally don't have enough information to navigate that at this point and, and, and make a vote that I can say I understand exactly what the implications of my vote are. If if you turn that around though, Tom, you're saying effectively that we would be denying this application on the basis of a hypothetical other application that doesn't exist yet. And I'm not sure we can do that either. I mean, I, I think we have to look at, at each one as it comes. Right now we're, we're talking about two establishments and two possible other ones. And what those other ones will be, will have to be decided by the ZBA and based a lot on the traffic flow. If we end up not having the full parking lot and the history of uh, a year or so or whatever time period goes by that it's not being filled, then they could probably uh, approve or disapprove um, a, re a retail establishment based on new traffic counts and so forth. So I, I am, am not too concerned about involving town council on this, but I will go along with, with the preference of the rest of the board. And I'm again, comfortable with moving ahead without, I feel like we, we know enough information. This is the nature of businesses in general. They decide what, where, the, what, where they're going to move into based on analyzing the facts on the ground as they know them at the time versus any number of open um, hypotheticals. So I don't feel strongly that I, we need any additional advice. Sarah? I think we need to look at case by case and that's where we are. We're looking at this one. So we can move forward is right. where I am too. So, um, me too. Okay. So, do we have any conditions that we feel we need to discuss, or are we ready for vote? I feel ready for vote, but I'm. Happy. You can't. Well, you missed. I do believe there are. So, I want to just again ask the question. I think that there was. Um, uh, a condition that we may import from the Toro Verde case that just has to do with the safety plan. So in the Toro Verde case, we set a condition or the, the board of January, 2019 set a condition for receipt by the planning board of letters of approval of this site plan from Waitley safety officials. That didn't have to do with traffic, that just ha had to do with their safety and security plan. That was, so I'm well, that, includes, out there. that includes traffic. The police would include traffic. Okay, but then there was a second condition that we would we might consider importing from tor the Tora Verde case. The second one being a requirement that every effort be made by, in this case, DMCTC, to facilitate traffic flow in and out of the facility with detail officers to be assigned to the site as deemed necessary by the Waitley Police Department. I'm happy to put these, um, this proposed text in the chat window so people don't have to just. Well, I have it in front of me. I don't know about. Right, right. So I'm, I don't know that everyone has that same benefit. So I think going... Tom is the only one that wouldn't have that because the rest of us were here. Well, uh, I was not here. Um, oh, sorry. And I just botched that a little bit. I can't quite edit it. No. Right, you weren't on here, but you have it now. I do have it now, but this is really for the benefit of the applicant. Okay. So they can see the language and I'm gonna just edit out. 
or verde D N C T C. I think I've got well, that while right. While you're doing that, I will move that we adopt those two conditions. I will I'll second that. Any discussion? Call for a roll call vote, Sarah. Yes. Don, what, yes. Is the, what is the vote on? Um, to adapt those two conditions. So I put them, Tom, in the chat window, numbered one and two in the Zoom chat. So the first one addresses DMCTC providing letters to us regarding so confirming that their site safety plan has been reviewed and approved. And the second one has to do with traffic management. Chris, so, you're able to see the chat. That, that, that's a separate vote from- You can't see the chat. To approve the site plan. All right. Yeah, so. I can't see the chat. I was debating whether to ask whether that needs to be public if you're talking about it. Oh, wait. Oh, you know, I'm sorry. For some reason, oh, the host is not allowing me to chat with everyone. So, Sarah, I was only chatting with you. Apologies. This is a little. I could see late. them fine. It was fine with me. Yeah. <laughs> if you could, under the security button, give participants the right to chat. Thank you for the guidance there. Whoops, not share screen. And then I'm. I've, chat. <laughs> No wonder you had that perplexed look, everybody. Right now it says my chat is disabled. <laughs> and I... So, so is, is the motion that we were, that we're voting for to approve or disapprove. Here we go. Now I that, see it. And does that I move mean... that we adopt those two conditions for this as part of the site plan review acceptance. And I think the next step. Approval. The next step would be to vote approval with those conditions. Okay. Do we have any other conditions? We didn't discuss any. I feel comfortable what we've got. Those are my main concerns for that property. What about the left turns coming out of that road? It's <sighs> a state road. If there starts to be problems, the state's going to step in. I'm just teasing you. I know. I had to come to terms with that can, one. That's a really we... tough one for me. Tom, have you, have you had a chance to read that, Tom? Yes. Are you prepared to vote? For the, in favor of the conditions, yes. Okay, so Sarah's already voted for, I've already voted for, yes. Tom? Yes. Brent? Yes. And Judy? Yes. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. So we voted for those conditions. Is that the same as voting? No, really for Tom's I benefit. That, now I vote that we approve the site plan application subject to those conditions. Thank you, Judy. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Another roll call vote, Sarah. I approve the site plan with these conditions. Don, yes. Tom? You can't vote, Don. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don, uh, abstain. Tom. Um, well, based on the, the points I raised before, I'm going to vote against the approval. Okay. Brent? I vote for approval with these conditions. Judy? Four. Okay, the motion passes by um, majority vote. So I thank the audience and the participants very much for the discussion. And because uh, we ought to move to Peggy right now, right? No, we have the, I don't know, would DM, Chris, There's would you second. be willing to hold yours after Peggy's ERCOG discussion since they're our guests? Yeah, I have no objection to that as long as uh, Jared and Isaac are okay with it. And by me. Okay. So this is going to, we're going to go on for a while, which is fine. I'm just, what's our schedule for tonight's meeting now? Just time-wise? Well, then we go to Peggy and then back to DMCTC. Okay. So there'll be a second public hearing for DMCTC. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. And, 
for yeah, Three River uh, Road? Three River Road, right. Okay. And how much time are we allocating for Peggy? I I don't think it's very long. We're just going to discuss what's going on so far, right, Peggy? Okay. Yeah. I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. It all depends on how many questions you have. <laughs> okay. So um, has everybody got a chance to get uh, Peggy's rewrite on this? Take a look at it. Yes. Um, so one of the things that I'm thinking that we need to do is um, I need to, I've got a flood plan um, map made. I just need to get permissions to upload it. Um, and then the three boards that, that would pos possibly come in to um, have to make a decision on this would be the planning board, the zoning board of appeals, um, and uh, the Conservation Commission, as well as, as um, the um, permitting authority. Um, and just my plan is that once the flood plain map is up, we just let everybody know that they need to take, if anything that comes in, they need to take a look at the flood plan and see if there's any possibility that um, their project would be within that. And at that point, uh, contact either the Conservation Commission or me to give them guidance because I've already talked to Scott. And um, I think that's the way that we need to sort of do an oversight on this. Is that about right, Peggy? Yeah, I, um, I added Don in the underneath the designation of the Community Floodplain Administrator um, coordination with other local departments and municipal officials. And so in there, it lists the building inspector, the highway department, the planning board, the ZBA, and the conservation commission. Okay, well, I so, had forgotten about the highway department, so. Yeah, so I think we just need to create um, either a new section in the zoning um, with what the application requirements are, because right now it's silent, this bylaw is silent. And so for example, in your site plan review um, or in site plan review sections, you often see you know, what the application materials need to cover and what information needs to be provided. So we can either add it in the zoning or if the conservation commission prefers since they seem to be taking the lead, with this review, if we just want to reference that, um, you know, that they have to go and fill out an application with the Conservation Commission. But either way, we need, it needs to be specified what the information is to allow this review to occur. So, so that would indicate that we should touch base with Scott and see what his preference is, I would think. I, I would think I did send the second draft to Scott and you'll see in under, you know, G review by the Conservation Commission that there's a note that says either create an application form, which could then be, you know, with the Conservation Commission and they could adopt, uh, adjust it as needed, maybe over time if there was some additional information they needed, um, they'd have that flexibility. Um, or we can actually load in the application requirements into this bylaw, but then, you know, if there's any changes, it's a zoning bylaw amendment. Um, yeah. So just, you know, it's, um, since this is a new area, <laughs> um, it seems like maybe it would be better to reference a Conservation Commission application. I would think so. Um, and then there's also a checklist that the state wants about all the different possible permits that it could happen in a floodplain. And so uh, Kimberly's reaching out to the state to find out if they've already developed a checklist, but if they haven't, then we'll try and prepare a checklist. And obviously town council will need to review that as well as this zoning bylaw. Since, you know, the state hasn't 
provided complete guidance on all the sections, so. Well, it's probably a good idea. My initial thought was that if we see anything in there, then we sort of hand it off to, to Scott, basically, or for me to take a look at it. And if I think it should go to CC that we hand it there, but uh, maybe the checklist, it puts more onus on the, on the other authorities. Um, that I don't think we have a choice done, it's required. Okay. Yeah, and so uh, the one other note that you'll see in, in the second draft is that we need to add the floodplain administrator to the distribution list for special permits and site plan review to make sure that he's or she is in the loop. Um, since they have um, the responsibility potentially for enforcement. So you remember the other section that hadn't been filled out was what the local enforcement process was. So yeah. basically I've suggested some language that it would be the floodplain administrator that would be responsible for issuing a letter of non-compliance to the property owner if there was any uh, problems with the development in the floodplain overlay district and identify what that non-compliant development was and, and have instructions for how to remedy the situation. Um, so clearly, the floodplain administrator now needs to be pulled into the loop of different permit permitting activities um, related to the floodplain overlay district. Okay, so that means amendments not just to the zoning, to the floodplain bylaw, but to the site plan review distribution list. I think so. Is, okay. is, the, is the site plan review, is the distribution list in the zoning bylaw or is it? Yeah, and it was just amended. <laughs> so, okay. But I think that's, we can do that as part of this without any trouble. And the special permit, when I looked at it, it looked like the special permit section was a lot more streamlined. So maybe the ZBA has their own special permit application. So they would just need to add the floodplain administrator in there. I don't remember what it looks like. It's online, I think. So the, the, we yeah. just we just redid that too, <laughs> but there's we'll find room to stick that in there. <laughs> okay. So, do you think we are at a point where we could start thinking about a public hearing for this, or um, or we should regroup for a little bit first? I think it would be really good to get town council's input. Okay. Since we don't, I don't have any other examples of zoning, of the new zoning bylaws going through the AG's office. So I think before we went to a public hearing, it would be good to have town council review it. Um, assuming you all are comfortable with the changes that are highlighted that I did. Important. I thought they were great since they put all the work on Scott. <laughs> and the new floodplain administration. Yes. <laughs> You did have one comment about whether we should uh, consolidate the definitions of structure and, and my preference would be to leave them separate. Okay, and that's something where, you know, once again, town council. Yeah. It would be helpful to have their guidance. Yeah. So, so the next steps are to send this to town council and to talk to Scott and make sure he's okay with yeah, to make sure okay with the changes. Um, yeah. John and uh, Scott and Brian and I had met to go over, and it seemed that the Conservation Commission was willing to take on this additional responsibility. Yeah, he didn't even really think it was that much additional work because they right. almost always hit anyway. Yeah, because they're already regulating any most activities in a floodplain district in, in effect. So this would add a few things, but hopefully wouldn't be a lot of additional work for the Conservation Commission. Um, and as you can see, it's a review process. It's not a permit process. So that's another thing that state said, oh, well, it can be a review process, but now it would be good to have town council weigh in on that. 
Okay. It wasn't clear in their model bylaw. Um, wasn't there something about it could be review, it could be a permit? I thought that yeah, was- Yeah, the, 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 the model bylaw initially called for a permit. Right. And so we questioned them, like, what kind of permit? A special permit? You know, and they basically said, you know, we can't recommend any a specific process, but it, it could be a review process. And right. so it wasn't in their model bylaw, but that was the guidance that they gave us, that they just want to make sure that there's a review. So, you know, once again, this is another area where having count, council's input um, would, would be very helpful so that they can look at the model from the state. We can send the additional information that um, the folks at the state that are working on this model bylaw um, provided about it could be a review process and then compare that to the language that I, I've drafted to have the conservation commission review it and to have the local enforcement um, be conducted by the floodplain administrator. Would you be willing to draft to send an email with a list of the issues you think it would be especially yes. helpful to have town council address? Yes, I can do that. I also should have put second draft up on top, just make sure everybody's <laughs> yeah. clear which draft they are. So I'll, I'll add that. Brent, Brent labeled it as a second draft when he put it in our folder for us. Okay. Thank you, Brent. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll do that. It probably won't be till next week, but I think you're ahead of most other towns. So Yay, Good. Well, thank you so much. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay. Good to Have see you. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night. Peggy. Bye. Okay, Chris, back to Toro Verde. No, I'm sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> <You're sorry. laughs> ah, yeah. Round two of the DNCTC show. Ah. Great. I want to. I want to go to Three River Road. That's what I really want. Very good. Um, so last we were here, we presented um, the site plan, which I'll pull up in a moment. Although I may need to be the a co-host again um, to do that. Oh, it seemed to have the power, so it's... Um, I don't think I changed anything. Great. I didn't see it listed on the participants, but it still works, so that's good. Uh, okay, so last we were here, we were looking at um, Three River Road and the proposed um, marijuana manufacturing facility, which is not allowed under zoning, but we are proposing to the ZBA that um, they allow us to convert an existing non-conforming use of a small engine repair shop into marijuana um, manufacturing. Um, you know, ZBA's primary concern is, is for us to show that, in fact, the business uh, that's there today was legally established under zoning, um, which I think we assumed that it was, but, but needed to show that. Um, we've got some information from old building permits and that sort of thing showing um, uh, that uh, uh, it seems to be the case, but that's more of a ZBA question. Um, also, which uh, discussion was had around um, the sort of front area of the building, and in particular, being very careful about the exit movement of traffic um, on, on this uh, quickly traveled stretch of road. Um, um, and, um, uh, and then um, I think, um, Finally, there were, uh, not finally, um, there's also the, the Hatfield question um, as, and then uh, we wanted, we were asked to submit additional information on um, odor control. So let me um, take these, uh, start to check these off. Um, so we did submit um, some information on odor control, which was uh, substantially the same as what was proposed over at Seven River Road. Um, that there'd be um, sort of high throughput carbon filtration units within the building to scrub the air um, before it's uh, ventilated through the HVAC system. Um, we provided uh, detail on that and also, you know, a, a, an, an in writing explanation of what uh, management is going to do to ensure that those are maintained and functioning optimally. Um, You'll also recall there was um, discussion about this portion of the existing building here, which is the, the very front part close to River Road. 
um, sort of a lean-to structure with a porch in front of it. Um, this is, extends into the front yard setback in the existing condition. Um, at, initially, uh, we intended to leave the building sort of as is, um, but have explored a little bit more closely. Um, and actually, there's two sections of the building, this being one of them, and a second lean-to structure right here that are not particularly valuable and also easy to demolish. Um, so the proposal has been changed to demolish those parts of the building, which uh, creates a conformance, which is great. And it also does really improve um, access and circulation and pulls the whole site a little bit further from the road. So those, those are all very good things. And so the layout that you see, I'm gonna highlight um, sort of the changes. Um, and I realize the, the parking striping is not showing up particularly well on this, um, but we continue to have um, our parking lot as well as some of the storage of those refrigeration units on the south side of the building as we did before. Uh, but originally we had proposed to maintain the existing driveway curb cut in this location. Um, but instead what, what the new plan proposes is for the main driveway for the facility to be located here um, which allows most employees and the few visitors that arrive um, to come straight in, park, and then exit straight out. Um, uh, and also um, as the, any uh, delivery traffic, truck traffic, and for moving those container units, um, it allows those vehicles again to exit uh, with a straight out motion um, to make sure that those sight lines are maintained either direction. We also looked at the sight lines even based on a 55 mile an hour uh, design speed, it's signed for 45. Um, we have sufficient sight distance in both directions based on um, the Ashto design guidance. Um, that said, we did look at the site logistics of accessing this portion of the site. And in particular that once a year when these refrigerated containers would come over from Seven River Road and it was still desirable to have access on this side because a motion up through the site like this would be challenging. Um, so as we discussed informally last time, we've now formalized this proposal, is to have what is technically a second driveway cut, but the proposal is to really de-emphasize this as a point of access through material. We're gonna use that permeable aggregate instead of asphalt. By width, this is a 15 foot wide driveway versus the 24 here. And it's also gonna be closed off with a chain on some bollards and a couple of planters, um, just so that it's very clear that this is not site access, except for those very few times when, uh, when maneuverability uh, around this portion of the site um, is important. Um, in addition, uh, I was talking about the sight lines, you know, these changes allow us to pull landscaping back. Um, the, the um, zoning standard is to have uh, 25 feet clear of obstruction. Uh, th these shrubs are generally low, but they're, they're potential as they mature to, to become obstructive. And so, so they are um, now much further back from the road. Um, really the only issue with sight line is one existing tree, uh, which is located on the property right here. Um, it's a mature tree, 36, maybe more inches wide. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it is close to the sight line in this direction from this location. Um, but that said, uh, if that's the only real obstruction, I would sure hate to have to take down a mature street tree um, um, in order to uh, make the, the site plan fly. Um, and now checking my notes to see if there was anything else um, that I was, wanted to be certain to highlight and nothing is, oh, and then the, the final piece was the Hatfield question. So again, the, the town line uh, runs through in this location. Um, there was one question brought up last time that this is marked as an approximate town line and, and why would we be showing that on a survey? Um, and so I talked to the surveyor just, just for information, although it's gonna become moot in a moment. Uh, there is what's called a road stone at this location, which is not an official part of monumenting where the town line is. The only official monuments occur at the corners, which is a couple thousand feet in to the right and about 9,000 feet to the left. 
Um, and so the effort involved with surveying the exact location of this line is quite significant. Um, with the demolition of these buildings, uh, you know, even with that approximate being plus or minus at worst a couple of feet, um, the building is clearly on the Waitley side of the line. And then all of that said, we've had some back and forth with the Hatfield Planning Board. Um, they are going to consider the question as to whether um, this project uh, in terms of what needs to be built in Hatfield can be allowed with special permit as the conversion of a non-conforming use. Um, and so we, we got confirmation of that about that in the last day or two. So we are gonna be proceeding with an application to Hatfield on their side. Um, and, and we're under the impression right now that until that permit is granted that the, the site plan that you see before you is not, uh, can't, can't be built. I'm happy to answer any questions about that or anything else that we were talking about last time. So we should continue until you hear from Hatfield? Um, I wouldn't, so I think I, I, I put it as a chicken and an egg question. I see this as the same as when a planning board and a ZBA and a conservation commission all need to approve a project is we need all of those permits to build. Um, I would suggest a condition that a building permit not be issued until such time as, as Hatfield has approved a special permit on their side, if you want some assurance that, that the project's not gonna move forward. Um, but uh, you, you, you of course are empowered to make your own decision on that. So, so you're effectively saying that if they disapprove, there's nothing you can do to amend it. Um, because the, if, if you were gonna change it as a result of their disapproval, then that oh, would- I see. Uh, Because if we want to, we would have to amend the site plan if we were gonna change it. Yeah, yeah, so it would be silly okay, for us to approve it. That. Um, I guess I would like to hear what Jared has to say because that's sort of a, a risk benefit decision because it means that, that we may have to wait for the next planning board meeting to make everything official, um, but it would uh, leave that open as the opportunity to amend the plan if Hatfield um, uh, disapproves. Because if you amend it, you will need to go back through advertising again and everything. Right, yeah, I, and I hadn't thought about it that way. I think we're, relatively confident that Hatfield is, is thinking favorably about this project. The question yeah. was really whether they could approve it or not, which was a black and white question. Um, but again, uh, is, is Jared on? I can't yeah. The whole yeah. So I'll, I'll yeah. leave it to you. Is The question is, would we prefer that they vote on this site plan as is and run the risk that if Hatfield disapproves, that we would have to then come back and re-advertise and, and reopen a public hearing to amend it. Uh, and, and just a little bit of education for me here. Um, does, is there any interplay with the site plan that's approved with the special permit? Um, if the site plan is this one and it is also approved by ZBA, would we have to go back to ZBA as well as back to the uh, planning board if the site plan were to change? Um, I think that what we did with um, the grow facility, we, we approved an amendment or a change to it. I think we could possibly do that. Just Well, it depends. We if it's a significant change, we would have to re Right. Well, even there, we have to re I would that this would be significant enough that, that it would need to be reopened. Um, just to, do or don't think so. I would, given that we'd have to move a, a driveway cut and, and there's a question as to how much we could access the bottom side. I, I mean, yeah, I think and you're changing a significant yep. part of the available acreage. Yep. Yeah, I, I had forgotten about the driveway cut. Yeah, just oh, I would draw my question. Jared, it I, makes it very challengeable. Yeah, if if Hatfield if Hatfield doesn't um, uh, doesn't approve as well, I, I guess I'm <clears throat> I'm feeling optimistic, and so I'd like to proceed with this, and we you know with full knowledge take the risk that Hatfield may not approve, and therefore we would have to reopen the hearing and do all that. Yeah. Right. Okay. 
But they're probably talking reapplying for the special permit too. Right. Potentially. Yes, sir. Could I just ask Chris what the date of publication of this set of plans is with the changes on them? Today. Today, okay. Yeah, it's, they're dated uh, uh, July 27th. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, so we, do we have any conditions on this at this point? I can't think of any. Well, I think we have to condition Hatfield's approval. Right, that was gonna be my next. Um, I mean, the, the normal conditions um, of yeah, our approval of, of the other town boards. And, and I think in this case, because there's so many ZBA issues, so specifically the ZBA and-, and We use that- um, older, Yeah, I'm just trying to- that we've been using. I'm just trying to bring that up. Maybe this is a, a case that calls for that. Um, so let me just give me, everyone give me one quick second. Um, and of course, we're fine with a condition requiring ZBA approval. We need that anyway to get a building permit. We understand. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do it, it just helps when we do our, you know, to the back to the building inspector and, and all. And, you know. I, I was at a meeting last summer where the building inspector came up. I totally understand. All right, so I'm sharing my screen. So assuming I'll fill in all the right details for applicant and parcel ID. We're saying this was our boilerplate, must receive approvals from all appropriate boards and committees. <laughs> well, I guess you're not, well, you might be doing construction, right? Regarding I think you could take that one out. Okay, that's fine. All right, and so the next condition, can we, somebody give me wording, notional wording? Don't we have yeah. an odor, being able to take action if there's an odor issue? So <laughs> do we have standard language for that? Oh, we can, I can, so I can put in the odor mitigation language. I'll dig that up in just a second. Let's, um, what's the language for um, conditioning on Hatfield approval? Uh, uh, must approve, must acquire approval from Hatfield, receive approval from, from, from the Hatfield ZBA. Uh, ZBA? Uh, it's entirely a planning board process over there. Oh, okay. That's right, the permit and site plan. Everybody's different. Um, what zoning, zoning approval must be received. Zoning approval. Okay. Failed. Okay. And then just give me one quick second. I'll look up what we did for Seven River Road uh, on our site plan conditions. On odor. So what we said there was. All right, so I'm copying. That, that one is cultivation. That might be, well. Well, let me, let me at least share, share the language. I'm just copying it. I'm pasting it here so you can see it. So this was the language from the Seven River Road approval. I think that's still good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good boilerplate. <laughs> I imagine we've accepted it before, so we'd accept it again. You did accept it before. Yeah, because we, we worked on that uh, language quite a bit. <laughs> or back, we back and forth it quite a bit. Really? It's what you call artisanal planning board condition language. <laughs> he spoke. You're such a nerd. <laughs> We wouldn't be getting slapped happy. Well, my wife is holding my dinner, so I'd like to well, give this 
all due expeditious consideration. My all right. spouse feels the same. <laughs> all right. So any other um, conditions? All right, then I will move that these be the condition, that these three conditions be uh, those for the uh, site plan approval. I'll second. All right. I was here for this, so uh, Don, yes. Tom? Yes. Uh, you didn't close the public hearing, I think. Oh. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> you want to be on the planning board, Chris? No. <laughs> he, is, he is. He's been <laughs> right up here. Virtually. All right. Any further discussion? Okay. The uh... All our, there were some other public, but the public has gone. <laughs> Their dinners were ready. I don't think they were for this. Bert, isn't Bernie close by? Oh, anyway, I'm Bernie's sorry. gone again. Okay, the public hearing is, is closed. So uh, we have conditions and we are not gonna vote on whether we accept those conditions. We have I move approval of the site plan with these conditions. Seconded. Okay, roll call vote, Don, yes. Judy? Yes. Tom? Yes. Brent? Yes. And Sarah? Yes. Hey, the motion is approved. Congratulations. Who seconded that on that one? Thank you very much. All right. Who second? I don't think we've got anything else under other, do we? Mary needs to know who seconded that last motion. Everybody. Yeah. Okay. Brent. Brent. <laughs> I, think, Brent. I think I did. Didn't Make I somebody up. <laughs> Brett did. I heard him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I did. So I'm, I got this document in our OneDrive. Site plan conditions. Okay. Do I have a motion to uh, get the heck out of here and eat? All right. Yeah. Thank you, folks. Thank so you. Thank you, thank you no guys more. very Bye -bye. much. We look forward to getting to work. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank Have you. fun. Have fun right there. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next to Tora Verde. I'm sure you're going to, it's going to be a great time for you. <laughs> okay, this meeting is adjourned. I don't know how that works.